Hello and welcome everyone to this fifth and final episode of our De Gruyter Corona Talks, today with the fantastic Mill Eisenberg. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Um, as all of you being the dedicated viewers and listeners you are now, we will uh, know, we will start with a, with a short talk by Mill and afterwards have a quick Q&A session between the two of us before then um, opening up the, the discussions to questions from the audience. I'm going to start with a short introduction. Uh, Merle Eisenberg is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center at the University of Maryland. He's a historian of the early Middle Ages and historical pandemics and has published history articles in past and present and the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, among others. He's also the host of the podcast called Infectious Historians, where he quite conveniently for us also um, had guests from our previous episodes, um, like um, Ida talking about the Spanish flu and also Thomas talking about uh, global solidarity as the, an answer to, to health crisis. So it's, it's really a nice way for our final episode to more or less come full circle. Um, and he of course also quite recently published um, in our essay collection, Perspectives on the Pandemic, Thinking in a State of Exception. And today he will uh, talk about dangerous comparisons, historical pandemics and COVID-19. So thank you, Mel, and you have the floor. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Just gonna, as always, uh, share my PowerPoint. Is that good? Perfect. Okay. So, as I said, uh, thanks so much for the nice introduction. I want to talk today a bit about how we compare past and present, um, often in deeply problematic ways. Um, as we just said, I'm an early medieval historian by training, uh, and my particular pandemic, I guess I work on, among other topics, is the Justinianic Plague, which is the first major plague pandemic uh, in history, and I'll touch upon that uh, a little later. Um, as far back as October, actually, so before uh, COVID-19, I've been thinking though more broadly about pandemics in history uh, due to some research I've been doing uh, and published uh, some public facing work as early as the beginning of, uh, of February, uh, looking at some of these questions. And I should also say, uh, as was just pointed out, much of my thinking has actually developed significantly from uh, what you see here on the screen, the Infectious Historians podcast, where we talk to a number of other smart people working on pandemics and diseases and public health and all types of issues like that um, across the uh, pre-modern and the modern world. And so that's formed a lot of my thinking as well moving forward. So the outline for today, I like to always give a nice outline of what we're doing, looks something like this. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the pandemic narrative that we often use both in academia and popular culture. There's no real difference between the two, um, but I'll separate them here just so you can kind of get a sense. Um, I'll talk about uh, how this functions and what I've called with my colleague Lee Mordecai, the play concept. And then I'll give a couple examples of how these comparisons are done. Um, the Black Death and the Third Plague Pandemic. These are two of the three major outbreaks of Yersinia pestis, uh, the bacterium that causes the plague. And then I'll look at why these pandemic comparisons are done, at least as I've been able to reconstruct it. And that's kind of lessons from the past and what we call hope for the future. Um, so both done at the same time. And then finally, I'll offer very brief thoughts on alternative ways of thinking and building a better future. Uh, the picture you see on the right is one of probably many diagrams many of you have seen at this point, which is of uh, illustrations of where COVID-19 fits in in the great pandemics of human history. Um, here you can see it slotted in right here. It's obviously an old screenshot um, from May, and so it's obviously both actually remained in the same spot, but the numbers have obviously increased. There's all types of problems with these diagrams. In fact, they're deeply, deeply problematic. Um, here's the plague. I work on the plague of Justinian and a little note that says uh, this is under review because of uh, recent research is my own. So I've managed to make a slight dent in this diagram as it were. So how are pandemics thought about today? Um, you can basically find these articles all over the place. Uh, the one you see here on the left, pandemics leave us forever altered is from the Atlantic, um, the June issue of the Atlantic. And I just chose this because I I get the hard copy of the Atlantic, which arrived uh, last week, actually. And so I read this and I thought, oh, God, here we go again. And lo and behold, here we go again. Mm -hmm. What history can tell us about the long term effects of coronavirus, right? So that uh, pandemics in the past are perceived in the past to be all pandemics. They're all the same in many respects. 
And I'll walk us through this very, very briefly. So as I say, pandemics are thought to be doing something, right? Uh, Lee and I have called this the plague concept, right? It's bound up in this idea that I think is kind of stuck somewhere in the back of our mind. I don't know where that is that the Black Death uh, caused huge change. And that's really the overriding uh, pandemic that's really shaped much of how we think about uh, the past and the present. Now, one could argue that COVID-19 will actually become the new pandemic that shapes our thoughts moving forward. That's a certain possibility, um, but that's obviously hypothetical and we will see. Now, what we mean here by the plague concept uh, is a pandemic as an autonomous actor that's used to just explain historical events without making connections to them, right? That's to say it's both ahistorical and transhistorical. It doesn't exist in a single time period and it exists across all time periods, right? So like we saw in that Atlantic article, all pandemics are the same. They just do something because we know they do something. As we've taken to calling it, it's the difference between what we think plague does and what it actually does. And again, we can wrap this around with other pandemics. Um, and I'll show you this from these two great slides on the screen. I should say uh, everyone in my family, both my, my parents, my, my siblings, uh, my in-laws, they all send me every plague article that ever comes out uh, within about a couple hours of it being published. So that's a new thing. I, I look forward to the text every time it happens. And these were two of the recent examples, but I think they really nicely uh, set the scene. The one on the left you can see here is uh, a herder in Mongolia caught uh, the plague almost certainly because he was with or ate uh, infected marmots, which carry the fleas that have Yersinia pestis, the bacterium in their gut. Um, so he was hanging out with a bunch of marmots that have Yersinia pestis. But as you can see in the pull quote I've done here, it says, a city put control measures in place after one, right? One confirmed case of the disease, which caused the Black Death in the Middle Ages, right? So you leap from plague, which still exists in the world today in one particular spot, directly to the Black Death, right? That is to say the most uh, devastating pandemic that so far we've known in human history in terms of percentage uh, of number of people killed. And then you can also see this, this one was I think from a couple of days ago, uh, a squirrel test positive for bubonic plague in Colorado, right? Always accompanying with a nice picture of your senior pestis as you can see here on the top. And then for some reason they always accompany with a cute little squirrel photo that must be in their stock. You know, I Google cute squirrel photo and you stick it there. Um, so yes, the squirrel did get your senior pestis, but you know, to make a long story short, plague has been in the Western United States since it arrived here about the year in 1900, essentially, during the third plague pandemic. It's been endemic to the entire Western half of the United States. There are squirrels that get plague every single year um, and marmots and other ground animals. Um, it's pretty common and there's also a couple of human cases of it, right? So again, this is how we're in a heightened stage. We think pandemics are gonna hit us. So now all these articles are coming out saying we found plague in squirrels, et cetera, et cetera. So this shows how you leap from a particular context to a broader one. And we aren't immune to this, obviously, in popular culture either. Uh, for some reason, uh, the most popular, uh, I mean, second most popular uh, movie on Netflix in the early days of March during the lockdown in many countries uh, was the movie Contagion, which is about a flu-like disease that spreads across the world and kills hundreds and thousands, if not millions of people. Um, why people wanted to watch a movie about what was happening outside of their world we can discuss if you're curious. Um, but for our purposes here, what's useful um, is you can see from this Daily Mail article that I pulled it from, I think it's a wonderful explanation of people literally combining what they think they know uh, from popular culture, which you see here on the left, to what's actually happening in the world today. So stretchers and gurneys of people being carried out, right? Ravaged grocery stores and quote unquote ravaged grocery stores um, during the early days of coronavirus, which seemed to be uh, toilet paper, water, um, there's been people debating why this happens and there's good reasons for it, um, but that's kind of what it looks like. So why do we think this way? Well, our own assumptions about what plague and pandemics do are key, right? And this is actually a newish idea of the last 30 or 40 years. Um, this is something that Thomas Zimmer in his talk and in his book, World Without Disease, has pointed out, right? There was a previous time period, the mid 20th century, essentially, where we thought we had conquered disease. And the best way I can illustrate this is with uh, Alfred Crosby's uh, book, right? Some of you may be familiar with this. This is the late environmental historian, probably the most influential environmental and disease historian of the last half century. Um, and he wrote one book on the Columbian Exchange, which is about Native Americans and diseases, and then one book on the 1918 influenza pandemic. 
And as you can see, the first edition from it, the one on the left here in the red, was simply called Epidemic and Peace. This comes out in 1976, right? Which is to say people already knew about it, but it wasn't as important in general history, right? We didn't think about pandemics as we do today. This connects, I think, very nicely to some of the work uh, Ida Millen has done, and she gave a talk on this about interviewing people, right? It wasn't as if the people who got the flu in 1918, 1919, 1920 forgot about it, right? It's pretty clear they've remembered it, but it's that we didn't place historical importance on it, right? How we thought about disease and this idea that disease is timeless and ahistorical didn't exist yet, right? We had to literally create that. And the best way to illustrate that is in the new edition of, of Crosby's book, which got renamed America's Forgotten P Pandemic in 1989, lining up neatly, obviously with the AIDS pandemic, it gets reissued again in 2003, which obviously lines up neatly with uh, Ebola, with SARS, with uh, bioterrorism, et cetera. And Crosby himself noted this. He said in the, in the, in the new edition, the America's Forgotten Pandemic, the one you see on the right, he said, quote, in 1976, when this book was first published, it seemed to be a piece of medical antiquarianism informative and interesting, I hoped, but with little immediate relevancy to our then current situation, right? So he's reflecting upon how no one really thinks about pandemics significantly at that point. I wanna now jump forward from how we think about pandemics very briefly to how we use them, right? This is the idea of lessons from the past. And here I'll just lay out two examples here and then one more, um, but you all probably can think of and know many, many more. The first, is from uh, the outbreak of uh, plague in 1900 in San Francisco that I've already alluded to. Um, the governor at the time, a man named Henry Gage, who you see here on the left, uh, dragged his feet. He didn't want to admit that there was plague in San Francisco, since it, since it would have led to a ban on the export of California goods to other states, right? And he had a particular reason for this. He was supported by large businesses and railroad interests in particular. So you can see how that nicely meshes up with his ideological thinking. And he went so far as to pull strings in Washington, D.C. and get the local medical expert fired. Economics here, we can clearly see not science, was and still is driving policy decisions. Now, the obvious implication uh, for someone living in the United States here is obviously with uh, President Trump and various Republican governors, right? You can leave that alone. I'm sketching it out, but it's probably very obvious and apparent. Um, that essentially what you get is we haven't learned our lessons very clearly if we know this from the past. You can also look at examples here, uh, as I've given you on the right. This is the burning of Chinatown in Honolulu uh, during the plague outbreak in 1900. This was an act of anti-Asian racism, uh, very clearly. And that's exactly what's played out again today during the current pandemic. So again, we haven't learned our lessons, uh, if you want to think of it that way. And just a third example here. The 1918 flu pandemic uh, is probably talked about the most aside from the Black Death, or in addition to, I guess you'd have to do it chart of Google and Grand to see which one people are talking about more. Um, but that is to say, we've used ideas of what the flu pandemic has done uh, since the beginning of, uh, of COVID-19. And here on the left, I give you just one article uh, from the National Geographic, right? So fairly public facing, um, uh, prestigious magazine. And what they've laid out is the recent research uh, over the last couple of decades, discussing how, depending on how you lock down a various city or state, is what the impact of the pandemic is. So on the left here, you can clearly see that depending on how you lock down, when you lock down, depending on how early you were hit, how much you were hit, uh, whether or not you got a second wave, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's what all the graphs are showing you. And lo and behold, we knew this at the end of March, and here's what the graphs look like as of yesterday or the day, day before in the United States based on um, states, right? You can probably find literal one-to-one -one comparisons from something on the right to something on the left. Right? That is to say we knew all this, um, but it hasn't actually changed anything. Or I should say it hasn't changed much. This differentiates between countries and cities and states as well. Um, but by and large, at least in the United States, we haven't seemed to have learned this lesson. The last thing I'll point out, or the, last, uh, the other reason why, is what I've called hope for the future. Right? And this is a slide uh, that medievalists are probably getting very tired of looking at. Um, I've uh, actually updated this just from this morning uh, because there was another article that came out making the same point. And this is essentially often linked to the Black Death. As you can see, coronavirus might reduce income inequality. It might lead to the end of feudalism. The pull quote from the bottom is actually from that Atlantic article, right? So that somehow the medieval people abandoned all sense of right and wrong, whatever that means, 
and it fostered the development of the middle class, right? It ended feudalism. Um, and then the other one everyone always likes to talk about, again, from this New Yorker article, is that somehow it leads to the Renaissance, and thus we're all going to be happier and better because it wasn't the Renaissance so wonderful and we're all going to be happy joy. Uh, these are obviously uh, completely factually wrong um, in many cases, um, but also misses the point, right? I mean, if you have to kill half the population of, uh, of say, the Eurasian world to get at a Renaissance, I would say that's not a sacrifice worth making. So what are some more positive ways maybe I could allude to this as we conclude? Well, as I said, uh, the plague in Constantinople, which is what I work on in the 540s CE, kills many people, right? This is uh, the image we created. It's named after the Emperor Justinian. We cut him out for this article and uh, replaced his image with knife images of the bacillus that causes uh, Yersinia pestis bacillus. And one thing we know from this time period is that actually uh, food shipments, for example, for example, were reduced, right? So within uh, a few months, there was less food being shipped because there were fewer people who needed it. But it was actually a fairly resilient system. That is to say, they had built in redundancies. It was a pre-modern world. They had to assume they didn't have weather satellites and they had to deal with weather. They didn't have good agricultural um, uh, ways of controlling, say, um, uh, irrigation techniques as much as we do today. They couldn't fertilize, right? The yields on the crops were much lower. And so thus they had redundancies built into the system, right? So if something went wrong, they could fix it within a few months or a few years because they assumed something was gonna go wrong, right? And this contrasts, for example, with today. This is some images from the beginning again of COVID-19 in March. And what we saw here in the top article in the bottom, the top picture of the left and the bottom picture on the, on the left as well, is farmers were basically plowing under their fields, right? Because the market was so efficient that we had no way of getting food from the, from the farms to the marketplace, right? I, there was a bunch of Twitter pictures, which I couldn't find, but I would have loved to find again, where people would say, I ordered five pounds of carrots. And you know what arrived from my door? It was one five pound carrot, right? Because it's made in that way for commercial uh, usage. And as everything shifted from commercial to home usage, basically there was no way to link that system. And at the same time, as we see from the awful photos on the right, uh, food bank usage shot through the roof, right? Because no one could buy food, no one had the money. And so what we've done is we've made a system that's so efficient that it can't actually absorb the shocks that are happening. So to conclude, I would say pandemic stories are often concerned with deaths, as I pointed out at the beginning, and system survivals, right? That is to say, how the political system goes on. And the answer to this question seems to be that even despite pandemics, political systems are rather resilient, right? They keep going and elites survive. But the ability of states to respond appropriately is constrained by current economic, ideological, and political structures that we need to actually adapt, I would say, moving forward. What's more useful is to change ideology and underlying systems, such as these market systems we've made so efficient so that they work for more people and they provide more just and equitable outcomes, right? That should be the focus, not just how many people died, was there better culture, but how can we make longer term stability for states, institutions, and more importantly, local people and their daily lives. So thanks so much. And with that, I'll turn it over to questions. Thank you so much, Mel, for this uh, brilliant talk and presentation. Um, I mean, um, comparisons uh, tend to be tend to come to us fairly easily, and often uh, I find very hastily drawn. Like um, from from the beginning of this um, uh, pandemic, the the Spanish flu has been the the go to comparison, because on the one hand, it really is. Um, comparable in, in medical terms and scientific terms. And, but on the other hand, maybe also because um, it ended quite quickly compared to, to other pandemics in the past. I mean, it was two years, three to four waves. And that sounds incredibly long to us now because we've only been through it for six months, but in the grander scheme of things, it's two years, it's nothing. And there's um, also, I think, comfort in knowing that we, we might not necessarily need a vaccine to get through this after all, because they didn't have one um, in 1919 either, and they got through it. So, um, yeah, I, th I think um, that's, that's one of the reasons people like the Spanish flu as a comparative um, pandemic so much. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that's definitely true. I mean, I mean, I think the problem with that comparison ultimately 
as I've stressed to a number of people in other places, is it's a very different world in 1918 than 2020, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the economics and the and the globalization and various factors are very different. So while God willing, the death toll will be lower, you know, the numbers on the Spanish flu I think are never really going to be known. Um, but we're not talking 50, 100 million, hopefully. Um, but the economic implications are certainly going to be more significant, right? And you yeah. can argue the cultural and social implications. So, you know, this is the problem, right? We reach to the past for something that works scientifically, um, but often it doesn't actually work for the situation we're all currently living in. And it really just leads actually to more problems than fewer, I would say. Yeah, that's true. I was wondering um, whether you know where the saying pandemics uh, are the great equalizer comes from. Because I, that, that's a saying I actually I couldn't agree less with um, for all this pandemic has really shown us is how, how unequal people and countries are affected by it based on the social and economic status and, and on their leadership, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and yeah, and I mean, in the beginning, it even looked as if some, some groups were more, more affected by the virus like older people, male older people, which make me like it <laughs> a little bit even. But of course, this has now shifted and, and it's starting to, to balance, to, to, to shift into a more balanced direction. But yeah, do you have any idea where that saying comes from and why it's always being repeated? Yeah. Um, well, why it's being repeated is a different question that I can get out in a second. But in terms of where it comes from, I mean, it's essentially, uh, if you go back to the plague I know, the sixth century, it exists there too, right? So the sources that tell us about that plague will say, um, old and young all died, uh, elites, non-elites all died, right? Now, this obfuscates the fact that those same sources will then, of course, admit, or later sources will admit, well, the elites could all run away from the city and go hide in the hills in their country houses, right? So in that sense, it's saying one thing, but it's actually showing another. Um, and there's other reasons why built into that. Um, you know, the idea of, of plagues as, as great levelers, I think ultimately in some ways, again, comes back to the Black Death idea, right? Where it does seem to be uh, reduce income inequality, quote unquote, right? It, it, it kills enough people, again, this is the problem, right? It's killing half the population or something like that, um, that, uh, that it does do something like that. But again, it doesn't actually seem to play out that way. Um, and it's also framed purely in economic terms, right? This is almost never framed uh, in human cost terms in many, many respects, right? And very clearly, if anything we've learned from COVID-19 is it's not a great level, right? I mean, you know, the, the, the first comparisons that were thrown out in some ways was Jeff Bezos, who owns Amazon, is now even richer, right? Because we're all ordering Amazon. Um, so it's very clear that it's not actually the case. Um, and so I think that's probably never been the case, except for maybe the Black Death. That was the exceptional case. And we've drawn the wrong conclusion from that, which is to use that as our paradigm rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. Now, the discourse as to why it's been used is because people want to say we all have a stake in it and we're doing something about it. And that, of course, is nonsensical, as many, many people have pointed out. You know, very good people work on sociology, anthropology, environmental justice, all these questions have very clearly pointed out that that is just a rhetoric of us pretending we're all in it together. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Um, and um, since you, you mentioned it in your presentation, I think on your fifth slide, uh, movies and, and Hollywood. So Hollywood apparently got a lot of things right after all. <laughs> and since uh, most of their movies ended happily, there's still hope for us, I guess. Uh, so, uh, but how much? Um, do you think is um, our thinking really influenced by some of those movies and media in general, maybe? I mean, how much of the, the panic in the beginning, you mentioned that the, the hoarding, the buying of, of toilet paper, for whatever reason, uh, was due to what we thought we knew about how the pandemic uh, would be like from, from movies? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so first of all, on the happily question, it's actually interesting. There's been a shift over that time period I, I sketched out over the last 60, 70 years. The movies actually used to end happily. Um, they don't really end happily anymore, right? Contagion ends happily in the sense that there's a vaccine, but no one's really happy at the end of the movie. And, and in many respects, a lot of movies don't even take place during um, pandemics anymore, right? They take place afterwards which is interesting because it's an assumption that we're all just gonna die and now it's about the survivors. Um, so something's changed in our mentality there. 
Um, but in terms of uh, how this works and what it works, it, it, it's something of, uh, of a feedback loop for sure between academia, popular culture, um, whatever else, you, the media, right? All of these people are doing and creating the same things. It's all part of the same scale. You can't disaggregate them um, together, right? I mean, the best way to look at this perhaps is, uh, I didn't show it on the screen, but the 1995 movie Outbreak um, with Dustin Hoffman and Rene mm -hmm. Russo, a few other people. Um, it's actually a romantic comedy as one of my uh, collaborators tells me, um, but uh, it's, it's very much at the same time, right? There's a media outbreak of Ebola. This is built on new scientific work about emerging infectious diseases that comes out of the late eighties and early nineties. It's a disease movie. You know, it follows all the tropes. And so most of this is this kind of just feedback loop mechanism that's working. Um, Priscilla Wald uh, has written a good book on this um, in which she coined it as calling the outbreak narrative, right? So that it follows mm -hmm. the same stages every time, no matter what happens, right? There's heroic doctors, there's awful government people doing bad things, there's racism, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but it does yeah. follow the same narrative. Yeah. yeah, and another parallel I think is that the, the um, doctors who have to decide whom they help and whom they won't because of yeah. various reasons, but what happened, what would really happened in, in Italy uh, in March, but yeah. they just said no, no ICU beds, no ventilators, no men or women power left to, to treat the elderly. Yeah. No, no, completely. And, and, you know, contagion has been, they worked with a bunch of uh, uh, scientific researchers, uh, I think epidemiologists, but I can't remember off the top of my head, um, uh, who, uh, you know, told them what should happen and what shouldn't happen. So that's been called a very realistic flu movie. Um, yeah. but. So we apparently need more experts, more historians telling us about past pandemics and how people in the past dealt with uh, their daily lives during um, those pandemics in order to be able to better deal with it ourselves, which is of course true for every part of our life, not only during the pandemic. Um, but would you say, like you have been giving talks um, and written articles um, for almost six months now about COVID-19 and um, past pandemics, would you say it really does make a difference um, when, you, when you reach out to people and, and try to explain or try to talk to them about, do you reach extremes? I mean, people who either think nothing can ever happen to me, it's all a hoax and I'm invincible, Uh, and the ones who think they, that the world will be ending once they step outside of their home? Yeah, so the extreme world is going to be in many ways, uh, I don't want to say impossible to reach, but very difficult, right? No matter what policy or idea anyone puts in place in any sphere of life, there's always going to be 10, 20% of people who are always going to have an issue with it from one side or the other. Um, but what I think you can do is you can present uh, different ways of thinking as I kind of briefly hinted at, at the end, right? There's different ways in which we can move forward and think in, in, in alternative ways, right? So, you know, one way is, is we clearly need to, at least in the United States, have a further discussion about what to do about childcare and education, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's one thing that, especially now, if we're not going to be opening schools, you know, you can't solve the economic problem without solving the school problem, without solving the childcare problem. And those are all bound up together. And so if you can present people different ways in which you can think outside your normal constraints um, of how you do business, how you think about marketing, mm -hmm. how you think about approaches to it, that's what I think is the most useful, right? To be, uh, to think differently in, in a particular time, especially at a time of crisis. Um, you know, it's, it's hard work. It's not easy, right? I mean, as I shared this New Yorker article, you know, the medievalists I saw uh, commenting about this were all up in arms, right? Because this was probably the mm -hmm. 50th article that's come out like that I could just keep showing them. Um, so in that sense, it's difficult, hard work. Um, but things like this, where you communicate with, with a broader audience, with a different audience, um, is very important, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I find, I, fi I find it interesting how many historians have become public historians during the last six months. Um, even the ones who, who never wanted to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right, because at the end of the day, people do now want to know about um, pandemics and what happened in the past. But what you have to tell them is the complex story of how hard some of these things were to get done. Right. I mean, that's ultimately the, 
what's going to happen to all of us. It's not going to be, I mean, we'll look back on it in 50 years and create our own personal narratives on what happened and how wonderful it was, right? I have small mm -hmm. children, so I'll probably say, oh, it was wonderful to spend extra time with them. Yeah, no. But, you know, <laughs> you know, but as, as all of us know about small children, the day-to-day -day of that is not wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is wonderful, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's very trying, I'll put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, it's wonderful, but then it's not exactly. <laughs> um, I read your your article from uh, in the Washington Post from February um, uh, about the, the the Black Death, I think, um, and also comparing it to to the um, current situation. And I read in, in one comment, uh, and that was uh, that the person said, um, "I'm I'm not going to seriously consider historical analysis of plaques from hundreds of years ago." Um, the time for individuals to get their bodies ready to fight this virus is now. So the article should focus on how to improve your immune system to fight against the virus, which is, I think, an excellent example of people thinking uh, they can somehow control when and if the virus strikes. Um, is, this, is this a new thing or were there um, always people who thought this won't hurt me? I'm too healthy, I'm too strong. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it would have been in that way, right? So, you know, the sources I work with, for example, would say, uh, because they're religious sources ultimately, right? Religion, Christianity in this case is much more bound up in their ideology, how they think, how they act. Um, you know, so they would say, if you are pious, if you act properly, um, if you all go and pray in the right ways, that will stop uh, the disease from spreading, right? Stop the plague from sweating. Mm -hmm. And then give examples of where that does happen. Now, medically, obviously, scientifically, that's not the case, but you know, that's how their worldview functioned, right? And so our worldview is very much a uh, post-enlightenment, modernist, whatever you want to call it, um, worldview in which we will all get a vaccine and magically we'll all be better, right? But that's obviously mm -hmm. not going to happen, right? There's distributions of a vaccine. Uh, there's a whole bunch of lists that we could get into, right? A scientist mm -hmm. would just list out. And at the end of the day, you know, that's not really going to resolve the fact that most of these new infectious emerging diseases are because of, uh, in many ways, environmental catastrophes and going into new habitats and destroying them, right? They're all from a spillover effect, which is to say they're spilling over from the animals to humans. Um, we haven't addressed that. Um, so we're only going to get another disease, as it were. And so none of this thinking of preparing your immune system. I mean, it would be great if we could all just take a shot and be better magically and all the problems would go away, but that's not actually what's going to happen, right? Yeah. We're not going to magically open schools. We're not going to magically resolve economics. We're not going to magically resolve infrastructure problems in America, for example, um, that exacerbate these for uh, communities of color. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of problems that need to be resolved. Mm. We can even talk about that. Yeah, that's true. But I think it's, it's very interesting how many people think um, this, this won't hurt me, this won't hurt my family until it happens to them. And then they just change like that. Yeah, I mean, the number of stories I've seen where someone said, I don't believe anything, and then they got and they said, and they're recording how bad it is to people so that they know um, seems to be significant, right? I see a new one of those um, almost daily. Yeah, true. I mean, this is sometimes it's, it's fueled by, by governments on purpose. Um, not naming any names here, um, but uh, speaking of governments, they uh, some most of them um, today they choose chose the economy over the people and over science as well. Um, was it also something that has happened before? Yeah. I mean, it can't have been that different, right? Human. Yeah, I mean, the question is, what do you mean by government, right? So in a, in a pre-modern sense, broadly, the government boils down to, and I'll get yelled at from medievalists for this, but it does broadly boil down to collecting taxes and paying for an army and running an administration, different levels of, of, of history administrations are bigger or smaller, but we would basically say that they're a, a small administration, right? Um, so it's really about paying taxes and providing for the army. Um, hmm. so in that sense, is all they were concerned with were those two things. And as long as those kept up, uh, it was probably okay, right? I mean, the economics, you need to keep the economics going for those reasons. Um, what's different today, 
I think, and even very different than 1918, is the sense of what economics is, is basically pervaded all aspects of our thought, right? I mean, there's a reason why economists are the prized policy experts, essentially. I mean, until this one, now we all love epidemiologists and disease modelers, but, um, you know, they're the prized people. Um, and so we've really basically put all our emphasis on economics um, rather than anything else. And that's kind of a mentality of the last, you know, I'm not an expert, but the last, you know, three, four, five decades, essentially. Um, and it's really obviously a problematic one because as we've discussed, you can't actually solve the economic problem, right? I mean, how, how do you solve uh, the economic problem if everyone in a city needs to take public transportation, right? If you're not investing in the public transportation, you can't basically have people go on public transportation, right? I mean, how many people want to ride subways or buses, right? Very few people, except those who are required to, because again, it happens to be lower down the socioeconomic ladder. Um, and then because the, this administration has less interest in, in helping many of those people, um, they're not fixing those, right? I mean, we want to open schools. Here's another great one, right? We want to open schools, but we're cutting their budgets. When we all know that they need to, at bare minimum, if they want to open, uh, you know, we've seen photos from other places that have opened, or as I have, um, you need to put in better cleaning within the schools, you need to put in um, mask wearing, you need to put in protective stuff around each one of the students practically. But what school district in America has extra money now to do that? I mean, they just don't. And so how can you possibly open a school if you're going to say that's the issue? Hmm. But that won't change the fact that they will open the schools. <laughs> well, that, that, that again, but this goes to how are you thinking? Your ideology is so pervasive about economics above all else that you just can't see these other choices, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you're just thinking so much an ideology of economics and that's, that's the real problem. And that's what I would say ultimately needs to be changed at least in the, in the U.S. context. Hmm. Um, I, what, I, what I learned, I think, um, from, from your essay as well, uh, is that um, through, basically through, through all health crises in history, more or less, um, minority groups were targeted as being part of or the problem. So even if we, if we only take um, th this pandemic and we take a look on how anti-Semitism on, on social media has been thriving since the start of COVID, uh, earlier this year, um, that also seems to be something we always fall back into and we can't break this behavior, we can't change uh, how, how that works, but it, it seems to be very hard to, to change um, this, this pattern, uh, but maybe talking more about this um, wouldn't hurt as well, so it should, should be addressed more often. Yeah, no, I think absolutely. I mean, I think that's always the case, right? When bad things happen, just use a term. When bad things happen, you you look to someone to blame them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's happening. I mean, as I said, in the third pandemic, that happens in the Black Death, that happens. Um, interestingly enough, it doesn't really seem to happen during the Justinianic plague that I work on um, for various reasons. Um, and it's it's hard to to get rid of, but what you have to do is is as a society basically make a concerted effort to basically you know, push back on that as much as you can. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're never gonna be wholly accessible, as I said, at the extremes, but surely that you need to have campaigns making this point. You can't have discourse coming from the top that's basically saying this, right? I mean, this was, you know, such as it was a positive sign is, you know, this is called COVID-19. It's not named after the place in which it originated, which is what used to happen with diseases. Mm -hmm is a very problematic racist way of doing things. Um, and so that's a positive in terms of that level of discourse, but obviously you need to keep going at all levels of society. Yeah, yeah. Especially if someone believes it's called COVID-19 because they have been 18 before. It's not helping. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, pandemics have been, before it started this year uh, in, in our world, um, have been looked at as something that, that happened um, predominantly to past societies maybe because of their, their apparent lack of um, scientific and medical knowledge um, and of the thinking that we are so much superior, that we are so much more advanced, that we are so much smarter than everyone before us, basically. Um, but this is um, thanks to, to COVID um, challenge now, which is, I think, a, a good thing if we make sure somehow um, to not forget about it 
again after it's over, if it's ever over. So um, maybe in, in, instead of assuming that the, the, the future effects of an outbreak um, are based on a past one, um, wouldn't be a better way to, to look at one or maybe several past pandemics or crisis in more detail and depth uh, and, and figure out what the respective pandemic actually did as opposed to what we just thought it did? Yeah, no, I pretty much right. right? I, mean, I think you have to look at the, I mean, this is, for lack of a better term, the point of history, such as I see it, right? The, the particular events and the contingent events that happen are what shape the outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. You can have structures that, that, that shape what people think, right? But how people react and how states react and how societies react is pretty important. So I think you could think about a series of models, paradigms in which you could outline how pandemics hit people and what the outcomes are rather than one outcome, right? I mean, just as one example is, is, is something I'm living through, right? I mean, you could imagine um, a very different world uh, in the United States. And again, this is hypothetical, so who knows, but a, a very different world in which rather than uh, Trump being president, you have a, a more generic, whatever that means, a Republican, right? Let's just ignore the fact that it might be a Democrat. Let's just say a generic Republican, Mike Pence is the president. Right, he's a fairly generic right of center Republican, right? We like him, don't like him, whatever. But presumably he would act very differently as president, as vice president, that's a different issue, uh, to the outbreak. And you could make that, that case certainly for previous presidents um, as well from all sides of the, the, of the spectrum. Um, again, working within the paradigm even of a conservative person running the country, I, I think the contingent events would tell you that there would be a very different outcome. And, and that to me, is the key, right? You, you can say the US has a broken public health care system or doesn't even really have one, perhaps is better. We don't have universal health care. These are all structural issues. We shouldn't tie health care to employment because when you, lo and behold, you have tens of millions of people unemployed, oh, look, everyone's going to lose their health care, right? That's kind of an issue. Um, but you could also imagine a world in which, at a bare minimum, you have someone just a little more competent running the state. Um, and that would have made a lot of a difference. Obviously. Yeah, sad truth, yeah. <laughs> but also, um, I mean, there were, after, after every, uh, or during uh, every health crisis in the past, there were changes and adaptations were made and helped create different societies. And I'm, I'm not saying better ones, because I think that's wrong, but different societies. So maybe now is, is really our chance to, to tackle some minor problems of our times, like climate change, uh, racial issues, um, just questioning existing state of the arts and seemingly God-given structures. Um, I, think, I, don't, I don't think it's a, it's a likely outcome, but maybe we have reached a point where the, the public rage is, is high enough to force change into societies. I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think that's that's certainly plausible. The question are what what are the outcomes you get? I mean, I think that's to an extent, um, you know, been part of the the part of you know. The, there's certainly a reason why Black Lives Matter is resonating at this moment uh, in time, right after the murder of George Floyd. Right, as everyone knows, that wasn't the first event. Um, that was one of the more awful events, but not even close to the first event. Not even close to the first event we had on film. Um, it is a point in which people basically, uh, you know, for like public opinion essentially flipped completely in the United States in terms of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and, and other problems, you know, across the United States when it comes to race. Um, and so that's obviously something that uh, you could say is a, is a, is a positive, um, I guess, from the sense of, you know, you might work for positive, better change in that regard. Um, there are moments and there are things that we can change. Uh, it's just a question of what you can take for granted and what you can't, um, you know, and how, how to do that is obviously the hardest part, right? I always say it's really easy to have a discourse about change um, and it's really easy at the outcome to say, oh, we changed it. But the actual mechanics of how you go from I want something done to actually get it done is a lot harder. Um, both at a, a high political level, whether it be at a, a federal government level or even at an academic level, right? I mean, there are changes that everyone wants to their university, um, but actually putting those into place 
is really hard because you got to sit in committees for a year or two years or whatever it might be and, um, and be willing to not get everything you want necessarily right away. Hmm. Yeah, that's very true. So um, I, I have a couple of my questions, but we also have um, several in the chat waiting. So I'm, I just end with, with one. I think the one of the biggest problems we have is um, patience. Um, I mean, it, it's during a lockdown when you're basically prisoner in your own home and you're um, surrounded by your family, which in best case scenario, you, you really like them. But after spending some months with them, with the same people and not being able to escape somewhere to meet friends, um, some things change and you maybe not like them as much anymore. But yeah, it, it, it gets really boring and dull. And while I personally have never had trouble with the concept of, of being uh, impatient whatsoever, uh, many people find it uh, hard to just sit back and wait things out, which is probably the, exactly the one thing actually stopping the virus from spreading. Also wearing masks, of course, but yeah, that, that would be so helpful in, uh, in ending this pandemic maybe a little bit sooner, but it's also one of the hardest things to do, I think. Yeah, I mean, that brings up a really interesting point. I mean, this is one of the, you know, it's only now I would say, I mean, there's other pandemics, but it, this is one of the er, first pandemics in which I think we have a sense of, well, we have one sense of how we want to push back against it, which is to lock down, to social, that's not really social, but to isolate from people, right? All these things that we're all doing. Um, and I think there's been some really good projects that people are doing about, you know, daily COVID daily coronavirus diaries. Um, because one thing I haven't seen that much of, and I'm sure it does exist for say 1918 and, and Ida would know much more of them than me, um, is, is kind of the daily dullness um, mm -hmm. for many people, right? This is not to say for all, um, many people are severely impacted. This is, you know, it, it's in some senses, right? I see it, um, you know, my personal, situation again with some with young kids, the, the, the outcome I see with my friends who are the same age who don't have kids, I don't know about you, but everyone seems to either be growing a massive garden in their backyard or they're baking a sourdough bread on a daily basis. I, you know, someone's gonna agree a great, uh, a great book one day about sourdough bread in this pandemic, um, <laughs> I believe that. Um, but, you know, there is, a, there is a certain restraint, especially, you know, I'm, I'm a, an extrovert, whatever. I'm a fairly schmoozy person, for lack of a better term. So I like to go out and talk to people and, and just kind of chat. And that's obviously not there. And so, you know, I think people have said from an early point, you know, all you got to do is stay home. This is your great sacrifice. You're not being called to go mm -hmm. overseas, to go fight wars, to do whatever. You're being called to stay home. Um, but there is a, a, a dullness to it um, that I think, you know, someone and something I'm sure it already has been done should be talked about more, right? The daily yep. life of what it is. The great advantage of being an introvert was <laughs> this, this topic. <laughs> okay, so I'm uh, going to, to questions um, from the audience now. The first one, you seem to be critical of historical comparisons in general, but isn't there an important difference between comparing two phenomena and equating them? Yeah, um, yeah. I, that's perfectly fair. Um, you know, the comparisons are useful in the sense of, uh, as I said, what happens before, what happens now. As I say, the slippage is what's happening is between the comparisons and the equating, right? I guess I could have called the whole thing uh, equating, um, but it doesn't have as nice of a ring to an extent. And I don't think that's what people are writing, right? I think people are saying, I'm comparing. They're not saying, uh, I'm saying it was like, you know, I'm equating it. Um, and so that's where the slippage is happening in a more technical way. Yes, that's perfectly fine, perfectly correct. Um, comparisons are useful uh, insofar as, as I said at the end, they give you alternative ways of thinking, um, but they're not useful as, as equating things. Um, and so mm -hmm. I've been more precise in my terminology, but again, that's not how it's being played out in, in public discourse, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At least in an English language public discourse, I should say. So, um, yeah, the only one that matters. <laughs> I didn't say that, and that's not true at all. But, um, uh, you know, as I said, that's end up what I'm reading uh, in most yeah. of my books. Okay, uh, next question. How can the environment affect the appearance of a new pandemic? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. of the, uh, what we'd all like to know <laughs> to an extent. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll give, you know, I'll just bluntly say, for example, on the plague, which is what I work on, you're saying a pestis, we don't actually know the interaction between environment and climate really is what I'm saying here and the plague, right? So we don't know the particular local and really micro local climate conditions that we need for why plague suddenly explodes and why it doesn't in other cases, right? Why it goes from squirrels to humans, right? We don't know really that connection because there's so many variables here. Um, in terms of broad thinking, the relationship between the environment and climate, and this is where say the movie Contagion is actually pretty good uh, in the, and actually I think it's the last scene where they reveal how it's done, which again, we'll never really know how it's done uh, in this case. Um, but I guess we could, I could be wrong, so I should say, we may know, but um, what's happening very clearly is as human beings are basically going further and further into natural uh, wildlife, uh, re reservoirs of diseases, we're interacting with animals more, which are then basically bringing their diseases and they're eventually spilling over, that's the word that's mm -hmm. into human beings. So this was clearly a disease of animals that somehow uh, mutated and, and changed uh, from animals to uh, human beings and that's how it spread, right? That's how we didn't know anything about it until uh, just, you know, six, eight months ago in theory and that's how it spread from there. Um, so, you know, that's to an extent why we've had kind of why we've had more emerging infectious diseases over the last 30, 40, 50 years is because we're destroying more and more of the environment. So more animals are interacting with more humans and we're having more back and forth between humans and animals. I mean, it also goes the other way from humans to animals as well. Um, but obviously as human beings, we concentrate on the, the animals that are doing it. Mm. Um, should, I mean, we talked about that before, but I'll still read it out. Should historians play a larger role in public debates at moments of crisis like this one so that comparisons become less counterfactual and more accurate? Yeah, I think we have to be careful about how we do it and how we do it, right? So in the sense of, you know, telling people a simple narrative of do X, you will fix Y, um, mm -hmm. isn't going to work and isn't going to last, right? What you need to do is to give people, as I've been suggesting, the tools to think differently and to act differently, right? And so that's why I brought up that just an Anic Plague idea, because that was a way in which people thought differently because they simply didn't have the economic thinking to think in terms of uh, market efficiencies. Um, but we can bring some of that thinking, um, not to say we should return to a pre-modern economy, I'm not encouraging that at all, um, but, um, but to bring uh, new different ways of thinking and different ideologies, right? We don't have to be, as I say, so efficient that, you know, we're dumping out milk into the streets because we have no way to can the milk or not can the milk, but bottle the milk for local consumption, right? And so that's the type of thinking or to build in redundancy. I was just reading about um, Hong Kong, right? One thing they've done after SARS is they built in a lot of uh, PPE material into nursing homes, right? And so that mm -hmm. they're ready for redundancies in the system, knowing full well that something's going to happen, right? I mean, part of the problem the United States had when it came to ventilators or PPE in general um, was simply that we didn't keep enough on hand because it wasn't profitable, right? I mean, you got to get out of that mentality. You got to lose some profitability at the end of the day to essentially change the system. So again, you don't even have to be a historian to look in comparative accounts, look at what Hong Kong is doing and bring that in as a policy lesson and build that into say legislation in the United States. Mm. Mm. What parallels between COVID-19 and episodes from the past that you have seen made actually ring true in your assessment? It's easy. Well, I think the I mean, the irony is I showed the, the, the flu pandemic, right? The waves of flu pandemic and the differences in places. And the reason why I showed that was that's literally what's happened, right? I mean, you know, I showed that as a sad, sad, I mean, really awful, not even sad moral tale of we all knew, right? I mean, we all knew that if you didn't reduce the count and you started opening up that you would get hit again. Um, and yet, we haven't adapted that uh, change, right? The past isn't wrong, right? You, you can draw examples that actually work. 
um, or, or have your parallels or equations, if, if like the first question that I got. Um, but the, the question is, you know, can you do something with that information, right? So you could point that out. I mean, the other famous one that I, I briefly mentioned is, um, you know, uh, uh, elites uh, run away from cities, right? I mean, there's a famous case in, in the mid eighth century in Constantinople, it's a little later in the outbreak of plague I work on, where the emperor and his entire entourage all run away from the city, right? Um, and we could find from Constantinople, right? They run into the hills because they know plague is there. Um, and we can find eerie parallels. I mean, I, I read an article that uh, that everyone was fleeing Paris, for example. This was back in late February, and they were all going to their chateaus in, uh, in in southern France, right? And the people who lived in those small towns were trying to not let them in, right? And there's this struggle back and forth. But again, you can see elites flee seems to be the the standard thing that's happened um, throughout history, such as I've I've, I've encountered pandemics. Mm. Yeah, fleeing to my chateau. That would be great. <laughs> you know, in some ways, right, we condemn people for that, but it, but it's an obvious recourse, right? If you have somewhere to go where it's, where it's not as bad, I think human nature basically would do that. Now, hmm. you know, 1,500 years ago, we wouldn't condemn the leads for doing that because the leads were writing the books that we read, so there's no sense of condemnation there. Um, we have that notion now because of how we think about society more broadly. Yeah, me too. Um, do you expand on the notion of the pandemic concept and how it contributes to misunderstandings of how infectious disease outbreaks have played out in the past? Oh, someone just wants me to expand. <laughs> um, you know, I think there's a question that seems, uh, you know, I'll just give one example. I mean, I haven't, again, this is something I'm working on. The plague idea I, I, I've worked through, and that's something that, that my colleague Lee and I published on, are in the process of publishing on. But you could see, the COVID-19 example actually is becoming more and more prevalent, right? I mean, we know today that there are significant economic changes. We know there are significant social changes. We know there are significant cultural changes, certainly. Um, and when you used to talk about, um, say, the Justinianic plague, again, one that I know well, the economic changes were stressed, but most of the others were pretty much downplayed. Um, and now we've seen much more conversation about the social and the cultural and much more strongly even on the economic. Um, and I have to imagine that's from, uh, from COVID-19 to an extent, right? I mean, again, we'll see what happens over the next three or four years in terms of academic publications. But it seems to me that pandemics as a, as a cause of change, right? We always talk about causes of change in history. What are they? We have lots of them, economic, social, cultural, blah, 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 on down the line. I think more and more we're probably going to see disease and pandemics. I mean, it's already there, but it's certainly going to be heightened by COVID-19. I mean, that seems mm -hmm. almost certain. I would be shocked if it wasn't. Um, and again, it's not to say that it, it it's wrong. It actually is right, right? Changes do happen because of disease. But again, you have to go into each context. You can't just slap on a disease and say life wasn't the same before and after um, because each one matters in their context and in their place. Hmm. Yeah. Um, next one, and maybe also the last one. Um, do you think mishandling of COVID-19 by many governments will be an obstacle for future historical recordings of COVID-19 or inspire and lead to more expansive exploration of what actually happened? It could go, I, it's not an either or question, I would say. I would say probably both will happen. Um, you know, on the question of mishandling of data, you know, this is a question that's always existed pre and before COVID-19, right? How do you count? And people have done wonderful work on this, um, you know, in terms of certainly in terms of 20th, 21st century statistics and how we count data. Um, you know, something that you could think about is how many people die in earthquakes, right? You know, the numbers for that or how many people die in hurricanes, the numbers for that are heavily disputed, right? Hurricane Maria in, in Puerto Rico is, is the most recent classic example. Trina, you could go through them all. The numbers have always been disputed. They've always been political. Um, and so you're gonna reach your conclusion on numbers, kind of what you already think, right? And, and the best example for this is, um, you know, I'll give again the last example from, from the Justinianic plague. Um, we don't have any numbers from the sixth century, right? The only numbers we have essentially are one writer saying, or a few numbers we have, one writer says 5,000 people died a day and then 10,000 people died a day. Well, if you just, and he says it's last for three months, if you just do some back of the envelope multiplication math, which is not how you should do these things, but if you did it, you would get 675,000 people die a day. And we think the population of the city of Constantinople was 500,000 people. 
So you've killed the entire population of a city and more, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of an issue in the past with numbers. And I would say it'll be an issue moving forward with numbers, right? Mm -hmm. I would say the COVID-19 numbers are underreported and I think most people would agree with that. But I think if you want to politically downplay it, you're going to start hiding numbers. Um, certainly like it looks like this administration is doing even more so, um, that's going to become the area of research and should be an area of research. Um, and I think you're going to convince the people you already have convinced. Um, and I'm not sure you're going to convince the people who want to downplay it, um, unfortunately. Yeah, that's true. And really, the last question, uh, any advice on how we should record our daily lives for future historians? Uh, I think there's a lot of people doing this. Um, probably if you just Google coronavirus diaries, um, I know a colleague is doing this in terms of religious reactions to it. Um, and so she's doing that. I've seen a number of uh, COVID diaries. I think it's been done really wonderfully actually at a teaching level. Um, so I know a number of classes have built that into the classes. So you could actually think about uh, doing a class, for example, in the fall where one of the components is do a COVID diary that you can then look back upon. Um, so I think any recording you do, um, you know, you got to figure out who's going to get the material at the end of the day and what they're going to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, do, who are you going to leave your diaries to? Probably don't put it and assume that Twitter will always exist. Um, so put it in some form in an archival form that someone's going to do. There's a lot of material out there and I would urge people to do it if that's something of interest to you. They're actually in, in Europe, um, especially, but brilliant initiatives um, by, um, by historians to archive everything they can find. Uh, and they started in, in March. So they have- Yeah, I think there's even... great stuff happening and I think it's gonna be how, there's gonna be a lot of material to work with. We'll put it that yeah. way in 50 or 100 years. Yeah, if it doesn't get lost, then we're good. <laughs> okay, so we are out of time, unfortunately. Thank you so much, Mel, for, for your fascinating talk. What a way to close this uh, series of Corona talks. And thank you to all of the people listening and viewing um, our talks. I had so much fun talking to all of my guests uh, and I really hope we will get back to this format again in the near future, maybe with a different topic because I think we've all had enough of COVID-19 by now. Um, and if you ever wanna listen uh, and rewatch any of the episodes, they'll be online for all eternity. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Mel, again. Um, thank you. Take care everyone and um, 